Give everybody a two minute warning. We'll get started on time this morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our last day of our October council meeting. Dewey Beach is actually starting to get beautiful now, sun shining. So it's all in all, it's been a great week. Thank you, everybody, for coming to my state. And before we get started this morning, I think Chris wants to say something. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank Wes and his wife, Elaine, and Sonny and his wife, Janine. Dewey and Shelly for her administrative support and logistics yesterday with our seafood extravaganza. I think the food was excellent, it was superb. And you know, the evidence is that there's no food left. So I think everyone everyone got uh, got their fill and we're very happy with what uh, you guys did. So we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. I'll be sure to pass it on to Elena. Uh, I told you, I said, you don't get this body by eating well. So I eat a lot. <laughs> uh, let's get today's session started off. We're going to do uh, protected resources. Uh, committee report from committee chair Chris Pat Savage. Oh. And protected resources. All right, we're going to do the SSC. All right, I'm going to put you on standby then, Chris. And is Paul Rago giving the report this morning? Yes. Okay, whenever you're ready, Paul. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'll be presenting the results of our SSC meeting uh, held in September, uh, and all the material uh, related to this is under tab 13. Next slide, please. We had five major topics that we addressed uh, at our meeting, uh, and one of them, uh, spiny dogfish specifications, uh, took up more time than we anticipated. So one of the casualties of, of that was that we were not able to address uh, the um, EAFM summer flounder um, MSE work. So uh, we will pick that up uh, at a later time. All of these topics have been addressed in, to some extent, in prior sessions uh, this week. So I will uh, focus on just a couple of major points on each of these of these topics. Um, these include uh, the dogfish specifications, the Northeast Regional Habitat Assessment, and then uh, three working groups that the uh, SSC has formed uh, for ecosystems, uh, economic uh, activities, and then ABC averaging. So next slide, please. Um, the, the major conclusion uh, from the dogfish specification work and I just want me the SSC wanted to reiterate here was that um, there really is a need for a greater investment in the stock assessment capacity. 
um, you know, the, we weren't, we did not have a stock assessment for uh, this uh, a, a decision that needed to be made. And so we, we did uh, do some improvisation or ad hoc uh, approaches, but um, uh, I think it's just a, just a general thing that, uh, you know, the, the timelines are very tight. Uh, decisions need to be made at, at certain times, and so um, we, we we recommend uh, you know some increase in in that capacity. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay, under the uh, Northeast Regional Habitat Assessment, that topic was also addressed by the council as part of the um, uh, recommendations for EFH uh, amendment here. Um, the, uh, I'll just focus on some of the uh, recommendations that the SSC made. Uh, one of them is that uh, the, there should be some inclusion of some of the earlier life stages, such as the data that comes from the Ecomon surveys. This, this is on plankton and uh, egg, uh, fish uh, eggs and, and larvae. Um, also, you know, there may be an ability to get a little bit better uh, resolution um, of, of some of the distributional traits of, of uh, species by looking at size classes, uh, you know, because uh, you know, physiological requirements change with age and that also changes their, their distributions. Um, the SSC uh, uh, worked with the um, New England SSC in terms of uh, providing a review of the uh, uh, Northeast Regional Habitat Assessment process, and so uh, there were quite a few recommendations uh, in that report, so I won't repeat them there. Uh, but one of the things that, that really was important, and uh, the SSC had some uh, recommended that uh, the annual updates uh, are, are important for these, for these data, large databases. Uh, they, they're, they're very hard to assemble, but they can sometimes be even more difficult to maintain over time. So you need to feed the beast annually uh, in order to ensure that the uh, information is, is timely. Um, so next slide, please. Um, the, the ecosystem working group, um, uh, Sarah gave a very nice presentation on on the, on the uh, objectives of the group and and some of the ongoing work. So I won't I won't repeat uh, that here. Um, essentially, the three objectives are are designed to operationalize, if you will, um, the, uh, the the state of the ecosystem report. We're always impressed by the content of it, and uh, each year and and this working group is now working to say, okay, how do we translate that information into decisions that uh, we make um, at, at the council level? And uh, so that can involve not only what the SSC decisions are with respect to uh, ABCs, but also uh, how can the uh, council uh, provide or, or obtain additional context? Uh, you know, one of the, uh, Topics that did get some discussion yesterday in our afternoon session was this uh, uh, multi-species uh, ecosystem indicators for overfishing. You know, so how do we look at sort of overall system performance? Um, and one of the ways in which some of these indicators might be tested is is through uh, large-scale ecosystem models, uh, commonly known as Atlantis. Uh, so that uh, was was a uh, you know, kind of a recommendation that the uh, SSC as a whole had on on this uh, on this work. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the economic work group has has done an enormous amount of work, uh, mostly with relate with respect to the research set aside program, and has you know obviously worked closely with the council's uh, research steering committee and uh, builds upon some of the work that. Uh, has been done uh, for the uh, EAFM for summer flounder. Uh, so those are those are uh, major accomplishments. The uh, the group also worked on uh, recreational harvest control rules and uh, and also some of the models that are used uh, as as part of uh, setting specifications. Um, as Garrett 
uh, highlighted yesterday. Um, uh, moving forward, he, he, he called it an organic process, but it basically is uh, driven by the, you know, the mutual interests and needs of the in, uh, expertise of the XSC, uh, along with the needs of the council. So um, we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, and uh, one of the one of the recommendations that uh, came through several times within the uh, RSA process was the need for more economic data. Uh, and in particular, um, uh, if the RSA uh, is reconstituted in a form similar to what it was before, um, where individuals bid, that it would be important to, to record that information. So uh, much like bid information for oil, gas, and timber leasing is, is already done. Um, the um, uh, SSC recommended uh, looking at uh, some of the work that's being done by other SSCs, and that'll come through and in, 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 again in a later slide. But uh, the South Atlantic, uh, you know, may have some say have some advantage or some information or processes or methods that that could be you know borrowed by us. Um, and then one idea that that was uh, proposed was. Uh, to, to start looking at uh, uh, contrasting fishery management systems. So, um, you know, so how does how do systems that work via catch shares and quota monitoring and uh, uh, evaluating the role of uh, public versus private influence in, in management and how those systems might be examined and then also ultimately used to Im improve the process uh, in the mid Atlantic. Um, and then there was a there was a suggestion that uh, under RSA that many of the uh, administrative uh, uh, processes that might be required to do that might be better housed within um, uh, an, another group, perhaps uh, ASMFC or um, SCMFIS as a as another uh, possibility. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, the um, ABC averaging um, group, um, you know, was again highlighted by Brandon yesterday. Uh, the ABCs are uh, obviously have are desired by by managers and harvesters, but uh, they can run into problems, uh, particularly with respect to the risk policy. So, um, and those those were kind of highlighted yesterday. Uh, depending on what the population size is and what the trend is, uh, you can violate these. Um, Parameter, violate the constraints. That is your your guidelines for uh, avoiding overfishing and risk tolerance. So um, you know we've done a number of, uh, of of studies. One is that we've demonstrated that the ABC can be maximized subject to constraints. That is, um, so the, the the key feature now is just refining those constraints. What are the the actual uh, limits on uh, risk tolerance that the council has. And so we'll be working with staff uh, to try to uh, improve that. And then also that we did look at some preliminary simulation work that suggested um, you could do almost as well uh, if you just take the initial projection year, that is the first year ABC, and apply it to the subsequent years. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of uh, advantage by, by doing a year by year. Uh, adjustments. So, uh, again, this is preliminary work that needs to be uh, followed on. Um, we also noted that um, uh, collaboration with the uh, population dynamics branch is uh, desirable and necessary if, if we're going to sort of um, do this uh, either more elaborate uh, process through optimization or, uh, you know, do uh, another alternative for multi-year specifications. It's just in everybody's interest. Um, and then, you know, finally, we noted that uh, because of the increased frequency of the management track assessments, um, you know, the longer term <clears throat> ABCs, um, you know, are, are not quite as desirable. A two-year constant average is, um, you know, doesn't have the same appeal as a three-year or five-year one might have in a when with the management track assessments were less frequent. So next slide, please. 
finally, we just we just had a little bit of um, uh, other business. We we commented on the uh, the the national SSC meeting that was held in Sitka, Alaska, and and really the high value of the interactions with the other councils SSCs. Um, you know, Brandon gave us an update on the recent delays in the track uh, research track assessments, uh, but you know we noted that. And probably not going to affect the ABC determinations, but uh, the, the pressure on the center is going to be high with respect to the, those intervals between the research track assessment and the management track assessment being uh, undesirably short. Uh, so um, those are those are all the I think the, the major highlights that I'd like to, to emphasize and uh, welcome any any questions you may have on, uh, on on going forward. So thank you very much. And, Back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Rago. Any questions? Just call me Paul. That's uh, that's an easier one. Now. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chair. You must have did a very outstanding job because you have no questions this morning at all. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe they're still enjoying the the great meal that uh, you had yesterday. So. Thank you very much. I think we were all pretty much full as ticks last night. Yeah. <laughs> all right, with that, we will move forward with Chris Bat Savage for the protected resources. Hey, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Screen. Uh, yeah. Before I get uh, started on the uh, on the presentation, I want to thank Carson uh, for uh, drafting the meeting summary and putting together this presentation. So, um, for that next slide, please. The uh, Protected Resources Committee uh, meeting was held by webinar on September fourteenth. Uh, we had um, nine uh, nine committee members uh, in attendance, as well as several members uh, from the public. Uh, NIPS and, uh, and council staff. Um, the committee reviewed the uh, large whale take reduction team uh, information on reducing the risk of whale entanglement in gillnet and uh, trap pot fisheries and the proposed right whale vessel strike reduction rule. Uh, the committee provided questions, comments, a data requests, and recommendations. Uh, next slide, please. The uh, committee first reviewed uh, the risk reduction measures being considered for the <laughs> Large whale take reduction plan. Uh, the risk reduction measures under consideration in the large whale take reduction plan could impact council, council managed gillnet and trapped pot fisheries. The uh, take reduction team uh, was originally scheduled to make uh, final recommendations in September on the uh, risk reduction measures for these fisheries, uh, th those not including, excluding basically the, uh, the Northeast uh, lobster and Jonah crab uh, trap fisheries. However, um, there's a new timeline now that has final action for all coastwide uh, gillnet and trap hop fisheries uh, for this November. Uh, next slide, please. So the committee, let's see. Skipped ahead, trying to move faster than, uh, than I need to. Sorry, Wes. Uh, the committee discussed uh, the new timeline in the context of the uh, gillnet and trap pot fisheries managed by the council, uh, including concerns that the timeline was too fast. Um, it was noted that the timeline could change depending on uh, future court decisions. Uh, the committee also discussed the ongoing efforts uh, for testing ropeless gear in the region and that more time is needed to test these techniques. Uh, the committee uh, raised the point again during the meeting that there are relatively few participants left in the mid-Atlantic gillnet fisheries. So the overall uh, proportion of risk to right whales uh, from these fisheries uh, is, is probably pretty small. Uh, next slide, please. So the uh, committee uh, discussed, um, also discussed the different tools in the toolbox for reducing the risk to right whales from, from these fisheries. Uh, reducing the number of vertical lines in the water is an option for reducing risk, but an AP member in attendance commented that a single buoy that single buoy lines for gillnets in the monkfish fishery uh, is not feasible and dangerous. Um, using weaker line and weak links are, are also options to reduce risk. 
Um, and an attendee also asked if, uh, if the risk reduction model accounted for the vertical height of gill nets with the idea that uh, higher vertical heights of, of nets could uh, result in a higher risk of entanglement. Um, next slide, please. So uh, based on the discussions and guidance uh, from NIMP staff and attendants, the committee made two requests, data requests to the tech reduction team. Uh, one is to uh, get the mid-Atlantic risk units by primary <coughs> fishery and gear type by month. And the second one was information that's either available or being used to evaluate the vertical uh, gill net height to determine entanglement risk reduction in the mid-Atlantic uh, gill net fisheries. Uh, we haven't received the information uh, from these requests yet, but they could be discussed at another committee meeting this fall before final action is taken uh, by the TRT in November. Uh, slide, please. So the uh, committee next uh, discussed the proposed rule to reduce uh, right whale vessel strikes. The uh, proposed rule includes measures such as a seasonal 10 knot speed limit areas and requiring vessels from 35 mm -hmm. to 65 feet go no faster than 10 knots in these seasonal speed areas. The committee had concerns over the uh, timing and area of the speed zones, particularly the inclusion of the month of May in much of the uh, mid-Atlantic region. Uh, a committee member stated that right whales are usually 20 miles offshore of Virginia Beach when they are present off Virginia uh, and are often gone by, by April. Uh, the committee member also noted that many boats travel along the coast within the seasonal uh, speed zones and that a buffer or exemption to the speed zone within a few miles from shore could alleviate some of the concerns. Next slide, please. The committee also had concerns over enforcing the speed limit, uh, the speed limit since AIS, the primary enforcement tool for uh, the current speed zones, is only required for vessels greater than 65 feet. Uh, it was noted that about a third of vessels between 35 and 65 feet already have AIS, but the Coast Guard uh, representative on the committee raised an enforcement concern over the number of boats in the recreational fishery on the water, especially during the month of May. Next slide, please. The committee also raised concerns over uh, emergency situations on the water. Uh, the proposed rule provides an exemption to the speed limit rule uh, when a gale warning is issued, but the committee thinks exceptions for safety purposes must be clearly defined and expanded beyond just gale warnings. Uh, examples provided uh, at the meeting included uh, a private vessel assisting another vessel in an emergency and avoiding and outrunning uh, thunderstorms on the water, especially for some of the smaller vessels that are going to be subject to the speed limit rules. Uh, next slide, please. Other concerns noted by the committee were the potential impact to boat manufacturers and boat owners and increased travel time for charter boat captains. Uh, comments made by the public uh, included uh, further evaluation of impacts to specific recreational fisheries is, is also needed. And this includes uh, council managed and HMS uh, managed fisheries. Slide, please. So after uh, a thorough discussion, the committee recommended that the council send a letter on the proposed rule with the following points. Uh, consideration of adjustments to the time and area speed zones and consider the impacts to recreational fisheries to balance risk reduction and fishing. <laughs> so for example, uh, is, is there a large risk, a large increase in risk by removing the month of May or the last two weeks of May from the speed rule or adding the near shore corridor exemption when there may not be uh, whales in, in that space and time. Uh, another recommendation uh, was uh, consideration of the enforceability of this rule in uh, state and federal waters. Uh, next slide, please. The uh, committee also recommends that, um, a, that the letter ask for the inclusion of clearly defined speed zone exempt exceptions for safety under a variety of emergency uh, situations. So uh, after the committee meeting, uh, NIPS extended the uh, comment period on the proposed rule until October 31st. It originally was going to close uh, last Friday on September 30th. So this gives the uh, council um, time to weigh in on the letter development and the comment. Slide, please. Okay, so um, this here are some of the uh, council considerations based on the committee meeting. Should the uh, Protected Resources Committee uh, should another protected resources committee meeting be scheduled before the TRT uh, makes final recommendations on risk reduction measures under the take reduction plan in November? Um, th if we had a meeting that would allow us an opportunity for the committee to uh, discuss the data request results 
and uh, other TRT analyses uh, to be released for, for coastwide measures. And the uh, second consideration is, uh, does the council uh, think that a letter on the proposed vessel strike reduction rule is warranted? And if so, does the council have any additional comments to include beyond the uh, committee recommendations? So uh, that, that concludes my report, Mr. Chair. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chris. Any questions for Chris? Before I go out to the audience, I'm going to put the Lieutenant Commander Matt Cayley on the hook. How does, if they put a 10 mile an hour zone, how is it enforced? Is it just through AIS? Is that what you guys look for? I mean, I, I can't imagine you're running radar on the Coast Guard boats. How would enforcement work? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, our primarily enforcement tool in this is AIS. So we we put a geofence up around the, the location, and then when we see vessels that are going above 10 knots, we can hail out to them on the radio. Um, with this particular one, if it goes into effect, um, lowering the vessel size restrictions to 35 feet, those regs currently state that they don't aren't they're not required to have AIS. So our kind of our primary tool, um, it gets more challenging. Uh, we ran some join ops with NOAA over the uh, the last uh, uh, right whale season, um, and so like they there's some technology that they uh, are introducing to um, be able to monitor speed. Um, from via radar on the on the water, uh, but we currently don't have that technology. But if this moves forward, it is something we would probably need to look into um, to en enhance the different tools that we would have available to us to enforce this. All right, thank you, Skip Feller. Yeah, I can comment on that a little bit too. Um, it is AIS, and one of the problems they're going to have, which I hear everybody talking about already, so. Boats over 65 feet have to have AIS, but under, they don't, but a lot of them do. And everybody is saying they're just going to turn their AIS off. And that becomes a safety issue. That's why they have the AIS for safety reasons. And then I do know that the NOAA boat that was in our area last year, they were using radar, just like a, that the police use, a radar gun. And I know listening to some conversations with ships, they were you know, wondering how accurate a radar gun is on the water with the boat going up and down and all that. So, um, it's a mess. And I can also say the presentation that Noah gave at our thing, the right whale sightings page that they showed was very inaccurate. It was so far off, especially in our area. Um, that uh, there's an outfit in our area, HDR, that is contracted with the Navy that studies the whales in the wintertime. Dan is the guy that runs it, and we work with them all winter. He is the one that tagged the three right whales that were off our coast last year and monitored them. They were in our area for two days, and um, they were 23 miles offshore. And I showed him the page that they showed us and he was the one that confirmed it, it wasn't even close. And then we also have a problem with misidentifying humpbacks as right whales because he brought up to me a, a page, there's a whale map.org you can go on, you can put in all your parameters and it'll show you the sightings. And he pointed out three that were misidentified and one of them we were sitting there and he was sitting there when the Navy boat swore it was the right whale. And it was. So there's a lot of problems. We'll go to the audience. Mike Wayne. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning, everybody. Mike Wayne with the American Sport Fishing Association. And I just wanted to follow up on some of the stuff Skip was saying. Um, we've done a pretty, <clears throat> working with a coalition of fishing and boating associations, we've done a pretty deep dive on the post speed rule. And Chris, this is, this is just a question to you. Um, what's the process for uh, 
finalizing the council letter, is there the possibility for us to share our comment letter with the committee uh, to help try to craft some of the input from stakeholders from the council on this proposed rule? I guess uh, in terms of process of if we if the council decides to write a letter, I may look to Chris more on that just so I don't misspeak in terms of what the typical process is for for the council to do those things. So, Chris, so we we've used a couple different ways of getting letters reviewed and out. Sometimes we involve review by AP. Sometimes we don't. So the first step here is to to identify whether or not we actually want to do a letter. Second step would be, what do we want to say in the letter? All that has to happen today. Uh, and then staff can work on getting the draft done and ready to go before the deadline, which has been extended, so we have a little more time. And certainly, um, you know, the council can decide how they want to handle the draft. So if, in fact, we want to get it done in time to make it public as draft before it goes to NIMS, we can do that. But Remember what we're doing, we're commenting on something. So we're providing a letter to NIMS on this proposed rule. Folks will see the letter in its final form, and certainly I'll have the opportunity to comment not only on our comments, but the proposed rule themselves. So a more straight line approach is to, is to agree to do a letter today, figure out what's going to go in that letter, get that letter drafted, um, get it out to the council for review. Uh, you can share with whoever. Get those edits back to Carson, the letter, get it in the news by the deadline. So that would be what I would suggest. First step, you gotta decide if in fact we're gonna do a little. Mr. Chair, follow up real quick. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I I guess I would just um you know request that the Council consider input from stakeholders when drafting their letter on this proposed rule. And I'd, I'd be happy to share our analysis on that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mike. Sonny Gwynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, <clears throat> would that mean, I guess this question will be for Chris Bat Savage that we would suggest a committee meeting before we write the letter to discuss it? Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's necessary, Sonny. Um, I think, you know, we um, addressed it pretty thoroughly at the committee level, and I think right now it's going to be up to the council, especially, you know, we did get an extension, but, uh, you know, we got this over three weeks. So I think we would handle that today. Now, the consideration for another council or a committee meeting I think would be more to deal with the uh, take reduction team um, you know, work that's that's also ongoing. Uh, you know, especially if we get our data request uh, results back to us. So I think yeah. So it's kind of two different things. You know, the right whale stuff, which is probably the most immediate, and then you know, how how we want to address future TRT um, uh, workings uh, in the next uh, few weeks or so. And in, and is in this letter, would you discuss some of the other issues besides the uh, 10 mile an hour speed limit? Yeah, I think, you know, again, with, uh, you know, with, with direction from the council, uh, yeah, we, we had a list of things. It was, you know, the, the 10 mile speed limit, with things associated with it, such as safety and, uh, and, and enforcement. Um, th those are things that the committee is recommending go in the letter. Um, you know, so if if the if the council to say today decides, yeah, that we we need to include that, that's great. And if there's anything else uh, that uh, should be included uh, in the letter, and I know we talked at the council or at the committee level about um, uh, you know impacts to uh, you know certain fisheries that was managed by the Mid Atlantic Council or HMS. So it's it's more than just that one topic. Uh, that one topic probably covers a couple subtopics. So. That, that's that's the thought, but really it's going to be, uh, you know, wh whatever the, the, the council thinks is, thinks is most appropriate. Yeah, thank you. And that was what was on my mind, not just the 10 mile an hour speed limit, but the, the whole pie. Thank you. I guess this question is going to go to Chris or to Carson. Do you have basically a list of some of the bullet points that would be in this letter? Do you have anything ready along that line? 
Yeah, so the list is, yeah, you know, there's a bulleted list in the um, meeting report um, in the briefing materials, and then it's spread across two slides in the presentation. Um, so maybe we can pull up the, we can pull up the committee or yeah, the committee report if, if that's better for people to look at. Yeah, I think it might be simple for people to see that way. All right, I'm going to continue on with questions while you're getting that ready. Adam Nowalski. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to jump right to the motion at this point. Um, if you're ready for that. Go ahead. Uh, and I'll be referencing in the meeting materials with the meeting summary. It does list those points that you're asking about. So I'm hoping we can encapsulate that. Uh, I move that the council send a letter on the proposed rule for right whale speed restrictions. I will pause to make fast. I move that the council send a comment letter on the proposed rule for right whale speed restrictions. The comment letter should include the points discussed during the September 14th Protected Resources Committee meeting. Think it needs to be added to the motion, but I'll just note that those points again are in the protected resources committee. We have a second on the motion. Pat Gear seconded. Oh, oh, all right. Ken Neal seconds it. You were just the loudest. I heard you first. Comments on the motion, Skip Feller. I just had one more quick thing on the the uh, May part, just so everyone's clear. I talk. I after our meeting, we I discussed this with Dan from HDR extensively. I asked him when was the latest right whale off of the coast, the, basically the Mid Atlantic from New Jersey to Hatteras, and he said the latest one that he's aware of was about eight years ago. It was early April and it was 50 miles offshore and it was an aerial survey. And that's how they found the three last year was an aerial survey. And I do know that they are ramping up their aerial survey with all this going on this year. But he said by April 15th, it was his opinion that there were no more right whales in the mid-Atlantic. They're all up north feeding back where they're supposed to be. Thank you, Skip. Peter Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for last evening. It was a it was a fun time last night. So thank you. Um, New England last week declined to uh, send a letter. Uh, there are multiple concerns. Um, one of the, one of the concerns that I that I have just as a small time recreational fisherman. I'm out in a 35 foot boat. Anybody knows what a shelf cloud looks like? Uh, it looks like a flying saucer, and if you've never seen one, please Google it because they're pretty intense. Um, and I see a giant shelf cloud out there, uh, and I'm 20, 30 miles offshore doing my thing, and I see this flying saucer out there. I'm, I'm, I'm hauling my butt out of there as fast as I can. There might not be any wind yet. There might not be nothing associated with it, no rain, but... You can see this thing hovering in the distance, and you know it's gonna it's gonna cause you some problems. Um, so I I have some concerns because I need to run away from that thing as 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 fast as I can and seek shelter because something's coming. Um, but yet there's no wind associated with it. But I think with some of these speed restrictions, is there are um, wind restrictions. I can't I can't. I can't get up on plane. I got a 250 horsepower outboard. I can't get up on plane and start running in until certain thresholds are met. 
um, in, as far as wind speeds are concerned. And, and to me, as, as, as a citizen, as a recreational boater, and somebody that enjoys going offshore, that's a real concern of mine. Um, Hopefully, people would. Hopefully, if I were stopped, they would look. I'd be go, I'd go like that, and they go, "Okay, get out, <laughs> go, keep going." But uh, but so there are some uh, there there are some concerns that I have, and that's just one personal concern. Um, but the the New England Council did decline to send a letter, and and Chairman Reed is here, and I would like for him if if he the opportunity to, to comment on why they declined to send the letter. So, so if if I may, Mr. Chair, I will ask Eric to comment, please. Go ahead, Eric. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, yeah, we actually had a presentation. I've seen the presentation before, um, and we had a pretty lengthy discussion. We had the luxury of having a presentation. Our comments were heard. Everybody's individual comments were heard and, and put into whatever the record is going to look like. Um, I, I have concerns about, personally, about the exemptions. Certainly, safety at sea is a big thing, National Standard 10, of course. Um, I have concerns about the exemption for vessels that are restricted in maneuverability can go as fast as they want. You've got an oil tanker who is restricted by draft, they can go 30 knots through the area. That, that they're exempt, which is kind of bizarre to me. I mean, I would think somebody's restricted in maneuverability should go slower, but that, that's another thing. So, and the other thing is AIS is only, you only are required to have AIS over 65 feet and within 12 miles of the beach. Once you get it outside of 12 miles, you can turn the thing off. But as far as what New England did, you know, I mean, commercial trawlers, they might make 10 knots. Maybe they make six. They don't make fifteen. None of them. So that you know, that's they're not all that affected. Um, my my problem is that in New England we had a, a variety of comments. There was no consensus, but every individual at that table could send a letter themselves, whether it's an organization or a person in general. And um, that's what I suggested to the council. And, and in fact, you know, what I said was I was worried about the PR. I'm going to send a letter saying, I don't, we don't like, we think this is not good, this is not good, this is not good. This. The public is going to say, well, the New England Council doesn't want to protect right whales. That's what they're going to say. And that I don't care for. So. And the other thing is, is, of course, yesterday we had a conversation about the fixed gear fisheries, ropeless fishing, trapless fishing, whatever you want. There is a tremendous amount of onus put on that, that particular fleet. And if one right whale is hit by a 65-foot you know, hatteras going 30 miles an hour, fixed gear fishery is going to pay. And I don't care. It's... To me, it's a no-win situation at all. That's, uh, I mean, I think that pretty much covers covers it. Maybe I wasn't so succinct, but the reality of it is, is every one of you has an opportunity to write your own letter, send it under your name, your signature. But I, 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 I can't even imagine what the outcome of a letter saying, one thing that you don't like about this speed rule is going to do for you. And I told my counsel, I said, well, Tom's going to write the letter. And he said, well, no, Robin's going to write the letter. Well, Robin's going to write the letter. Give it to Tom and give it to me, and I'm not going to sign the thing. Because of, of the perception that don't like this, which means we don't want to protect you. So I just, I'd like to caution you on this motion. You've all got the opportunity to comment individually. But collectively, uh, we declined. So, yeah, I mean, if you got any more questions of me, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. But that, that's, I think that's where it came down. That's certainly where I came down. So, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Scott Lennox. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, quick question. Does, does the motion as it reads allow for any uh, input from industry? And I ask because some of you may have seen there's a there's a letter uh, to the assistant administrator from, I think, 12 different organizations it, with their opposition to this. Um, and they've kind of done the work for us. Um, if you think about it, it's very comprehensive. Uh, it goes into detail about uh, the way that they're uh, estimating the strikes and things like that. So I'm just wondering if the, the, the motion as it reads would allow for input from a letter like that where we could, you know, not copy and paste, but you know, get some get some information from it. Adam, you have a comment or rebuttal? Or? Well, as maker of the motion, I'll just offer my input on the intent of the motion. Uh, the language in the motion says the comment letter should include the motion does not offer anything that precludes anything additional. So it is my intention to ensure the comments from the committee meeting at a minimum are included but anything else that this council and or staff find appropriate for inclusion, it would certainly be my intention to see that included in that letter. Scott. Thanks for that, Adam. Uh, and, and that being said, then I, I, I can support this motion. I'd really like to include this letter from these different organizations because, like I say, it's very comprehensive. Um, it gives detail. I think at the end of it, it just says something about postponing the, the rule to do some more research, which I think is also a good idea. Um, and on Eric's comments, um, you know, I think we should write a letter about this. You know, I understand what New England did, but um, I don't think we should be afraid to speak our opinion as a group if we can all agree on it. Um, I just don't like the fact that you know, sometimes in the world today, people get scared to do things, whether it's right or wrong. And I just don't think that this rule is right. So I think if we as a group um, vote to move this motion forward, I think it's a good idea to write this letter. Thanks. Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I, I, I really take great offense to say that we're afraid to do anything. And we had a great discussion about it. And there is, it, it has nothing to do with fear. It's being smart as, as opposed to being perceived as not wanting to protect right whales. Got I'll apologize in person after the meeting, Eric, but that's absolutely not what I meant. Um, no, it's, it's more of a, I think you guys understand what I'm saying. I, I wasn't trying to be offensive in saying that anybody was afraid. I just don't like to feel personally that, um, that, that, a, that a, I can't move forward with something because of what somebody might perceive. Right or wrong, I'm going to say the things that I want to say and do the things that I want to do. And as a group, I think if we do that, uh, I, don't, I don't think that it's going to be a bad thing. Thanks. Chris Pat Savage. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and uh, yeah, I appreciate the, uh, the 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 motion and the comments uh, <clears throat> so far uh, about uh, a letter. Um, and I was thinking a lot about um, the New England Council's decision and Chairman Reed's comments on on this letter, uh, if if we choose to write one. Um, and you know, there, there's definitely a balance here between protecting uh, right whales, which are Every you know, no, and no one will deny they're in they're in really bad shape right now with less than 350 uh, individuals left. And I don't think, personally, I don't think the letter should imply that we're not concerned about the the stock status of of right whales right now. Uh, they they do need protection. Um, the uh, points that uh, we talked about uh, at the committee level, uh, it did never never said that we disagree with going forward with this proposed rule. Uh, it was really to consider uh, certain aspects of the rule um, to maybe make it a little more workable for the, you know, the, the different folks on the water while still provi providing uh, you know, the, the appropriate protection for, for right whales. It's a, it's a, it's a, that's a, a, pretty, a, pretty, uh, a pretty narrow uh, tunnel to, to go through, I think. Uh, on that. So, I mean, you know, I, I would support this motion as long as the letter, you know, acknowledges the fact that, you know, we, you know we're concerned about the right whale population. Um, and we're not saying that, uh, 
you know, th this rule is unnecessary, uh, but we just have some concerns about certain aspects of the rule and uh, would ask the, uh, the service to consider some of the things that we mentioned uh, as, as possibilities for, for you know, modifying it when it becomes final rule. Uh, so this is uh, more workable for, for everyone. Maureen Davidson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chris, I agree with what you say. Sitting here at this table, uh, I work for an agency that is striving to protect right whales as well as provide protection to our fishermen. And uh, as such, I was going to ask if in this comment, in this letter to, uh, to Noah, can we also mention the impact that this is going to have on some of our fishermen, especially in the mid-Atlantic region, who will have to comply with this, although we don't really have the numbers of fishermen that are present further north. Um, I'm not asking for special consideration of just our fishermen. I'm saying, can we look at some of these means that are in, in the uh, rule and see if we can comment on it on how it's going to impact uh, our fishermen? Uh, I do support sending the letter because, yes, we do want to protect right whales. Um, that is very near and dear to me um, for what I do. But also, I feel responsible that um, our fishermen, especially our commercial fishermen, are not necessarily in a very extreme manner affected such that they cannot conduct their business when they're on the water. Okay, thank you. Sonny Gwynn. Thank you, Maureen. Um, you probably said what I wanted to say. But one of the things I'm looking at it on this um, motion is rule for right whale speed restrictions. And I look at it as that's all we're sending a letter to. I, I, I'm trying to understand it. And I have a lot more concerns than just the speed limit. I want to, there's, there's a lot of concerns I have that I would like to see in the letter. Number one is the, um, the virtual meeting. Uh, next month in November, we're having a virtual meeting for a final to come out, come up with some ideas. We know what the speed limit is, but on the commercial end, we don't know what we're going to do. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a casino game. You know, we might as well go to casino and figure out this uh, problem. But um, I would like to know what, what we're going to do in the Mid-Atlantic before we, um, you know, come up with a letter so that I know what we're going to do. And um, if we could, um, you know, I, I don't even know how to express the words on, on a letter or just the speed limit when this, this problem is so big and it's going to affect the commercial fish industry so bad. Um, so I'm hoping if we come up with a letter that we can incorporate every, every concern that we have and not just the speed limit. And one of the problems I'm having is the virtual meeting. Uh, I just can't get my head wrapped around a virtual meeting when this um, this problem is so big and it's going to be so astronomical to the commercial fishing industry, uh, it's going to change things. It's going to change the way we work. It's going to change the way we make money. It's going to change the way we feed people. So um, I think we should think it over and maybe ask the, uh, the maker of the motion to add something in there to make this letter encompass all the all the problems we have. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Sonny. Mike Petney. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I'm trying to decide I'm, I'm whether I'm going to abstain from this motion or, or oppose it. Um, some of the comments that I've heard, and that's because we don't have an actual comment letter in front of us to evaluate. Uh, some of the comments that I heard from Mr. Bat Savage, you know, I would, I would probably, if that was the, the function of the letter, I would abstain. Um, some of the comments I, I heard, I, we just heard, and from Mr. Lennox, you know, I would oppose this, the, the council um, putting those forward as the council position. Um, you know, I, I, I would advise the council um, to keep this letter focused on the proposed rule that's in front of you um, regarding the proposed speed restrictions and and, you know, understanding that there are larger issues at play uh, over a longer time frame. But, you know, the agency is is looking for comments on this specific rule. 
so that we can finalize a rule and, and get that implemented as soon as possible. I'd also encourage the council, if it does choose to send a letter, to keep it focused on ways that the agency can improve the effectiveness of the speed rule. You know, keep in mind, there are two sources of mortality in right whales. There's vessel strikes and there's entanglements and fixed gear. If we don't reduce the risk across the board, then one or the other is going to have to absorb and, and reduce that entire risk. So what we're striving, what the agency is striving to do here is mitigate the risk from vessel strikes while we also mitigate the risk to, um, from entanglements. So I would just encourage council to keep that in mind um, and keep the letter focused on ways that the council believes the agency can make the rule more effective um, and keep it focused on the, the speed proposed rule. Thank you. Adam Nowalski. So again, as maker of the motion, I'd like to uh, agree and concur with the comments from both our committee chair, Mr. Bat Savage, as well as the comments we just heard from Mr. Petney, that that is the intent, to focus on how do we make the rule better. Uh, for the record, uh, whether or not it gets taken out of context in other venues or not, I am not in favor of any measures that are going to further endanger the right whale. I am in favor of prudent management that strikes the right balance between that management and the impacts and how we can make our actions and the services actions most efficient to achieve that goal of sustainability for all our resources. Uh, I would offer uh, that if it's the will of the uh, council at this point, perhaps a language change here instead of proposed rule for right whale speed restrictions, uh, perhaps it would be appropriate to reference the rule directly by name and change it to the proposed North Atlantic right whale vessel strike reduction rule so that we're clear that we're addressing the entirety of that rulemaking proposal. And you're okay with that? You say yes, just for the record. Dan Farnham. Yep, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. You know, I, I can support this motion only if it's crafted in the manner of that, that I just heard from, from Adam Nowalski and Chris Bastavich uh, sitting next to me here. It, I do have similar concerns to from what we heard from Chairman Reed over here. Um, this, this whole issue is rather large, obviously. Um, I think in, in, in the context of, of speed reduction and, and in, in ropeless troll requirements, I think that the most important thing to, to remember is you wanna keep the scope and size of any of these regulations uh, down to a footprint that's as small as you can make it while still protecting these right whales. Um, across the board, speed reductions up and down the coast, or even you know gear requirements up and down the coast, are that it, it's insane in my book to do that. Um, and I, I think I can support this letter, but I also my my primary concern is with fishing gear regulations here too. How the commercial fleet's going to be affected up and down this coast? So any any. Any direction we take on this letter, I, I really implore the council to consider, um, you know, the same consideration for the commercial fleet that's going to be affected also. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Caroline Good, thank you for being so patient. Hi there. Thanks so much for um, letting me just clarify a couple things. I, I heard a couple things earlier in the comments that I just wanted to um provide a little bit of additional information so there wasn't potentially some confusion or or misinformation um, also first of all with regards to the safety deviation provision i just want to clarify that there are additional components of that which do go beyond the specific weather exemptions for vessels 35 to 65 feet 
within areas where there has been a gale warning or, or a greater wind warning declared. So for example, we are proposing to also include exemptions for you know any kind of emergency if someone is having um, you know a health issue, someone's having a heart attack, they've been injured, broken a leg, et cetera, obviously. Uh, vessels could speed in. The other thing too I wanted to clarify is if a vessel did find itself in the midst of a weather situation which in which they did have maneuverability problems and needed to transit at higher speeds, um, you know, in their in the midst of of a particularly poor weather situation, even if it is not in a zone where the National Weather Service has declared a gale warning or greater wind warning. Um, that is also something that would fall under the compromised maneuverability um, component of that safety deviation provision. So I just want to highlight that, but I realize that is separate from the issue that some of the commenters also brought up about preventatively um, transiting away from oncoming poor weather conditions. The other thing I also want to clarify is with regards to enforcement, um, the NOAA Office of Law Enforcement has the primary uh, responsibility for law enforcement, not Coast Guard. I just want to make sure that that's uh, very clear. We have been um, working with them now for many, many months um, on plans for how we would enforce the proposed changes to the speed rule. Um, I, I'm not at liberty to go into too many details regarding all of the strategies used, but um, they definitely will be including other strategies besides the reliance on AIS data. Um, we are obviously well aware that there are many vessels under 65 feet that do not use AIS. Um, we right now estimate that about a third of the vessels in the 35 to 65 foot category within that would um, likely be transiting within the seasonal speed zones do use AIS. And um, we realize though that in some cases it's voluntary, although other we, all, we are also aware that in some cases you have vessels that are using AIS because it may be a matter of company policy. Um, it also may be um, related to maritime insurance as well. And so sometimes there's other requirements for AIS that are not necessarily associated with US Coast Guard. Um, but we do we, we do have many other um, options for both tracking speed and enforcing speed for vessels within this size class. And again, um, those plans are definitely in the works, but I just wanted to make that clear too, that NOAA OLE is the primary um, agency that is working on enforcement and is responsible for enforcement of the speed rule. Lastly, I also just wanted to touch too on this issue about the presence of right whales in the Mid-Atlantic during the month of May. Um, and uh, I've, I've also worked, um, I know there were comments um, regarding Dan and the US Navy projects um, off Virginia outside the Chesapeake, and I've worked with him. He and I collaborated on numerous projects and uh, there, I just want to clarify that there are definitely right whale sightings and acoustic detections in the Mid-Atlantic region during the month of May. However, relative to other areas, there has been very little survey effort. So we haven't had comprehensive uh, surveys the way we have, for example, in areas like the uh, calving grounds off Florida and Georgia, similarly up off New England, where we have much more comprehensive survey effort going on. We haven't had that in the Mid-Atlantic, nor have we had um, as many um, acoustic um, buoys out as well. So we wouldn't expect to have as many, and that's why one thing I just want to be very clear about, that that's not something we would expect because we're not looking. The other thing I want to highlight too is you know, if you think about it from the perspective of the whales migrating, whatever whatever goes south down to the down to the calving grounds must come back up north. And as they both go south and come north, they are transiting through the mid-Atlantic. Uh, we do not, we tend to find that right whales are on the shelf. They are not always dramatically offshore. It doesn't mean that they, we don't find them out in the canyons and, and off the shelf, but for the most part, and especially uh, mother calf pairs as they are coming back up north, they are hugging the coast and we see this again and again and again. So I just want to highlight that even though we don't have as much effort in that area, that doesn't mean whales are not there. The other thing I just want to be clear about the Mid-Atlantic in particular is there, the Mid-Atlantic um, along the East Coast has the, the highest um, volume of overall vessel traffic. There is a truly extraordinary amount of vessel traffic in the Mid-Atlantic. And when I say extraordinary. I mean, not just for the U.S. East Coast, I mean globally. This is one of the most 
highly trafficked areas on Earth. And so that is another component of why the Mid-Atlantic in particular is very risky for any right whale that's present. It's just because of the actual totality and volume, given all the ports, the recreational activity, the commercial activity going on, there's, there is um, a very, very high level of vessel traffic in this particular region. So I just wanna make sure that everyone is aware of um, some of those details. Thank you. Mike Wayne, if you can keep your comments real quick, we'd appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to speak again now that the motion is on the board. Um, I just wanted to speak in support of the motion as Adam laid it out. And I, I do see this to be well within the scope of what the council should be commenting on, all the councils, all the Atlantic councils, um, you know, you guys are the subject matter, matter experts on these fisheries and you repre represent the constituents. Nobody wants to hit a right whale. Uh, everybody understands how serious this is. We took, we took this very seriously. Um, and I really do ho hope the council considers some of the comments that we made in our letter. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak multiple times on this. Uh, the talking points are on the board right now, if you can see them. And I'm getting ready to call this motion to a vote. Can you scroll down, please? Or scroll up, I guess. Since we have changed the language a little bit, I'm gonna read it into the record. Move that the council send a letter, send a comment letter to on the proposed North Atlantic right whale vessel strike reduction rule. The comment letter should include the points discussed during the September 14th Protected Resources Committee meeting. All in favor, please raise your hand and please leave them there so we can get a good count. I have 16, please put your hands down. All that are voting no, please raise your hands. I have two against, please lower your hands. And any abstentions? One. The vote passes 16, two to one. Carson, do you have a time frame how long it'll take you to get this letter ready and sent out? Um, I can get a draft to leadership um, and move on to the next steps in about a week. Okay, thank you. Even though I encourage all council members, we are sending this as a council. Everybody should send in their own letter with their own comments just not on speed restrictions, but on ropes and everything else, whatever else, you know, it's gonna be affected by this. So I do encourage everybody on the council and in the audience to, to let them know how we feel about it down here. And with that, we're gonna move on to our next agenda item. Barsha, are you done with everything? Okay. We're gonna move on to the executive director report. Chris Moore. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. There's a uh, number of things behind the tab. Uh, I'll try to be brief. First one, like uh, every meeting, is our planned meeting topics for the upcoming meeting. Uh, if you take a look at that list for December 12th through 15th, uh, that meeting is going to be in Annapolis, likely to start on Monday. So expect to uh, travel Monday morning, or if you want, come in on Sunday night. Definitely starting at one o'clock, as long as this list holds, because there's a lot there. So if you go down the list, 
going to take action on our implementation plan. We've discussed that that this week. A number of actions related to recreational measures working with the Atlantic State Spring Fisheries Commission Board. As uh, we indicated uh, yesterday, we're going to take final action on that surf clam amendment uh, scenario planning. Remember to take a look at those questions that Kylie posed to you uh, yesterday because we need to have a really good discussion about those uh, particular scenarios as we tee up for our February meeting the summit. So again, uh, I encourage everyone to look at those. We have uh, habitat activities report talking about wind and believe it or not, we'll be looking at that Ocean City video project. Pretty cool. So uh, expect that. Um, also, um, as we'll talk about shortly, we have uh, an extension on our ability to provide comments on the Hudson Canyon National Marine Fisheries San or National Marine Sanctuary uh, fishing regulations, and uh, we'll be talking about those in December as well. The, um, the other thing that uh, just to note, we'll talk more about it in December over the next couple of weeks, we're going to have a CCC meeting uh, in DC. We'll also be having an NRCC meeting in Boston. So several of us will be involved in those meetings and I'll report out on those when, uh, again in December. The uh, meeting schedule for 2023 is there again. Uh, we moved things around a little bit. Um, it's going to be a different sort of year for us. We're going to start out our meetings in DC. We haven't been in DC for a while. So I expect uh, Sam will be there with all kinds of NIMS folks because we'll be so close to where Sam is. And uh, note that we also have uh, we moved around our meetings typically um, when uh, when we look at the summer and the winter, uh, we're going to have our summer meeting with the board in Annapolis at the Westin. And then we're going to move to uh, the notary in Philly in December. And we're going to be at the Yotel, Sam's favorite place and Sonny's favorite place in October. So expect that. Uh, 2024 council meeting schedule, those are the dates. So uh, folks like to plan ahead. Uh, we like to get it out there so that uh, our partners know when we're going to be meeting. So they don't schedule it over us. Um, but we haven't figured out locations yet, specific locations. So we'll go back, I'm sure, to some of our favorite places. We may try here again. Folks seem to like it here. Uh, it doesn't seem to be too hard to get to, uh, even with the hurricane stuff. But uh, so we'll see how that all plays out. So Shelly will be busy uh, getting the 2024 schedule together. Um, any questions about any of that before I move on? So next uh, couple documents are typical documents just to use as reference, indicate what we're working on. Certainly we'll start, uh, you'll start seeing changes in those as we move through the end of 2022 and into 2023. Um, one thing to note, uh, if you take a look at the next document behind the tab, timeline on recent actions and amendments, we have something that we took action on that's not so recent, which is that Black Sea Bass Commercial State Allocation Amendment. Uh, we have completed the package and we're hoping that a proposed rule on that comes out soon. We're anticipating, I think, that uh, that'll come out at least by the end of uh, 2022. Be nice if we can get that implemented by uh, early 2023. Remember what's in that package. So we've already had changes in the state by state allocations for black sea bass through the commission process. Both the commission and the council took action on that particular document, approved those allocations. A significant part of that document was the addition of those allocations into the federal state. Both the commission and the council voted for that. So we're hoping that that's actually implemented. 2023, and there's a number of reasons why we think that's important. I'll certainly go with those if you have any questions. Um, the next one is specifications for fisheries. Again, that'll start to be updated as we move through 2022. Next item behind the tab is a letter to Alexa Cole, who is the director of the NOAA IATC Seafood Inspection Program. A lot of acronyms sprinkled throughout the letter. Basically, it says we want to be involved as they revised uh, this uh, document that's referenced there with a lot of words. It says um, we had discussions with your staff, uh, seafood inspection folks and FDA folks, gather information about the National Sanitation Program 2019 revisions, the guide for the control of molluscan shellfish, model ordinance and supporting documents. 
And we're interested in that because we actually have fisheries that uh, are affected, surf climate and ocean clog. Industry is very interested in us keeping track of that. So uh, we've asked that uh, we continue to work closely with their staff to, uh, to track that. The uh, next item behind the tab is monkfish, relates to monkfish. This is a memo from Jason and me uh, talking about monkfish specifications. For those that don't know, we have joint management authority with the New England Council on monkfish. So we get involved in monkfish discussions, and Jason lays it out pretty well there in terms of where we're at with that. Certainly, uh, I could turn to Peter or Eric if they have any additional questions on monkfish when we get a chance. But basically, we'll be looking at uh, monkfish specifications and any associated management measures during our December meeting in Annapolis. I'll stop there before I go through the rest of this stuff, see if there's any questions. Any questions, comments? Peter? So thanks for bringing up the monkfish issue. Um, it is jointly managed between New England and ourselves. Um, I am on a committee. Um, I'm the chair of the committee. Uh, we have worked for almost a year in developing alternatives without having any advice on specifications and what the what the long term outlook looks like. Uh, um, so I, I'm just going to read this right out of my report. And during the council meeting that took place last week, um, we reviewed a, um, a, a management track assessment update. So this update has not yet been peer reviewed. Um, so this was just an update that we'd received at the beginning. Um, and we were informed that the survey index for monkfish is much lower, notably lower, than it was during the 2019 assessment. Uh, this means that total allowable landings will likely need to be reduced for the next three years, and that reductions may occur in both the northern and southern fisheries. Recognizing that landing limits likely will be reduced in 2023 to 2025, the council voted to move three of the framework's proposed uh, alternatives to the considered but rejected um, bin. Um, so we worked on this this for for over a year, developed alternatives, received an update last week, and threw out all of our work that took us a year to to, to put forward because we thought the stock was in good shape and did not have the uh, puzzle piece that we needed to tell us other, otherwise. So. Um, there's going to be some reductions in monkfish in both the northern and the southern fishery. And, you know, that's concerning, but we need to work jointly with that council. I don't know what that's going to do to their timeline, as they have it in their timeline that final action is supposed to take place in December. We do have another committee meeting and an AP coming up uh, prior to that, uh, but I don't know that we're going to get alternatives out there, but we are under, um, we're kind of under a hard, fast timeline. we got to get something done. Because the, the the rollover um, uh, uh, alternatives going forward and into the um, are, aren't aren't great either, uh, so um, just be aware that we've got some we've got pretty heavy lift with monkfish. We're looking at so thank, thanks for that, Chris. Thank you, Peter. Other questions, comments on any uh, material talked about so far, and uh, as Peter. Oh, Jason, go ahead. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, you know, that October 26, 27 SSC meeting will be kind of you know, fairly key. It's not super clear to me, um, you know, what, if any, control rule risk policy New England has specified for monkfish. Um, so it's, you know, the it's it's still very unclear to me what um, you know, the assessment suggests. Definitely a recent declining trend, um, and we'll have to kind of see um, in late October where their SSC ends up, and then um, you know that will kind of drive the bus of of further discussions. Jason, anything else before we move? So obviously, Jason will continue to track it for us and. Uh about uh, what happened when we get to our meeting in December. The, um, the next item behind the tab is an update on offshore wind energy development from Julia to me. Uh, she notes, 
our second sentence, sentence of this is not intended to be an exhaustive list. I think Julia is becoming exhausted though, putting 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 the list together and keeping track of all the all the wind stuff that we're involved with. So take a look at those. Certainly, I'm not going to go through those. One item to note is that uh, down at the bottom, uh, Boehm announced Karen Baker as the new chief of the Office of Renewable Energy Programs. Uh, it's interesting because uh, her office actually reached out to us to have a uh, set up a call to talk with. Uh, with me and Julia, so uh, we're looking forward to that. Um, next item behind the tab is something that uh, we've talked about uh, quite a bit this week. Uh, it was referenced again this morning by uh, Paul Rago. Uh, this is the press release fact sheet that went out relative to the Northeast Regional Habitat Assessment Data Explorer, uh, basically uh, telling folks that it's ready, uh, it's useful, uh, play around with it, and certainly I encourage the council to take a hard look at it and see. Uh, See how cool it is. Uh, Corey uh, is here. Uh, I don't know if you have anything to add, but certainly um, you can talk to her. Uh, she's the principal, one of the principals involved in putting all this together. Continue to update it, uh, make sure all the data there is as current as it possibly can be, between the limitations. Uh, it's going to be useful to us for a number of things, including um, EFH, uh, HAPC stuff that Jessica referenced the other day. Also, some of the climate change uh, things that uh, we're talking about. So, again, useful, very useful tool. And uh, well received. We're tracking uh, who's using it, how it's being used. And again, I think it's going to be something that people are really going to like. Um, let's see. Next item behind the tab is a reference to a meeting that was held uh, on Thursday. Uh, September 29th, basically, the Natural Resources Committee met to consider the Sustaining America's Fisheries for the Future Act. Some of you may have tracked that. Certainly, you can go back and look at the video to see what happened at that particular hearing, meeting. Um, we are prepared to track anything that relates to changes to Magnuson. So, we being principally Mary, tracks that for the council. And as things evolve, if we need to, or I should say it this way, if we're asked, to provide any comments on any part of that legislation, certainly we'll do that. So we'll be, uh, be to, to provide information on that. Uh, Mary will track it. Dave Whaley's under contract to provide uh, updates to us as well, and I make those available as we get them. Um, any questions about any of that before we move on? Um, we uh, put this agenda in. Look, just to let folks know what happens at these HMS advisory panel meetings. Uh, Dewey is involved with those. Uh, we have other folks. Uh, Hannah is tracking HMS actions for us now. A lot, a lot goes on there, and some of it does have application to what we do as a council. So uh, we track all things HMS. Um, and the last item behind the tab is a letter that everyone has seen. Uh, hopefully, you've had a chance to read it. This is a letter to uh, Mike Luizzi, Mike Pentney, um, disapproving the majority of the provisions in Amendment 22 to the Mackerel Squid and Butterfish Fishery Management Plan. And uh, he points out in the letter basically uh, what we were trying to do with Amendment 22 and then details why uh, he rejected that particular, uh, those particular provisions. And talks about uh, national standard four and five and six and seven. Obviously, we're very disappointed to get the letter. Uh, Jason and staff were involved in this particular action for a number of years. Not only Jason, but Garfo staff and the center staff as well. So it was a heavy lift, uh, contentious topic. And folks remember public hearings and the council meetings that we had on this particular amendment. And again, disappointed that it uh, uh, wasn't approved. But, you know, we basically are now in a position where you know, we pick ourselves up, dust ourselves off, and forward with, uh, with uh, basically looking at this topic again. So, as uh, we indicated earlier, this is part of our proposed 2023 implementation plan. Uh, we have a meeting scheduled, I can't remember exactly one piece of the Squid Mackerel Butterfish Committee with the AP to consider the letter and next steps, but I believe it's in November. 
so uh, we will have that meeting uh, that particular uh, at that particular meeting. We will come forward with some some ideas regarding what we do next. We'll bring those forward to the uh, council meeting in December and have a good discussion there. Um, there's a number of other items that are a supplement to uh, my report. Being this um, HR four six forty four six nine zero markup review. Take a look at that when you get a chance. Um, the uh, HMS advisory panel overview presentation uh, I think is an excellent thing to look at to give you a quick summary of what uh, what happened at the HMS meeting. Uh, doesn't take long to look at that. I suggest you take a look at that as well. The Hudson Canyon 304A5 consultation extension letter is basically a letter indicating that yes, we can have an extension to get those comments in. That when you get a chance, if you're interested, very short letter. The next item is a mega electronic mesh measurement gauge method for measuring net mesh size. And that references basically a topic that uh, we have been involved with before. Uh, some folks may or may not remember it. Um, the uh, the letter references the proposed rule that uh, was recently published. Uh, we have until the end of October to provide comments. We've already uh, provided comments, I think, meeting that we had back in December of 2021, where we received a presentation from the Coast Guard and GARFO on the device, the rulemaking process. We had no objections to the use of this device. And I would expect that uh, we don't have any objections now, unless someone Thinks differently. If you think differently. Now's a good time to let me know. Um, and finally, uh, just to give you some additional information on monkfish and some of the other things that uh, happened up in New England, that monkfish press release. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thanks. Any questions for Chris? Seeing none. Uh, Let's take a five minute break so anybody else has got to check out, grab a cup of coffee, whatever you need, and we'll come back at 1030 and finish up for the day.
All right, welcome back, everyone. Let's get started with our last handful of agenda items. We're going to start off with organizational reports, Greater Atlantic Regional Office, Mike Pentney. If you're ready, go ahead. All right, thanks, Mr. Chairman. A few items to go through for the council today, and then as always at the end, I'll be happy to take any questions. Starting off uh, with macro squid butterfish issues, uh, we published the uh, an interim final rule on August 8th to increase the 2022 ILEX squid uh, domestic annual harvest to 40,000 metric tons. This was done at the request of the Mid Atlantic Council. Uh, based on uh, an increase in the ABC recommendation from uh, from the council's SSC. The action also adjusted the closure threshold for the illic squid fishery from 94% um, to 96%, also as requested by the council. We've already talked about Amendment 22 and our disapproval letter, so uh, Chris addressed that, so I won't rehash that. Uh, moving on to tilefish. On September 14th, we published the proposed rule for framework seven to the tilefish FMP. This action includes the 2022 through 2024 specifications for the golden tilefish fishery, um, would modify the annual specs process uh, to keep it in line with the uh, NRCC schedule for stock assessments. Uh, and it also changes or would change the start of the tilefish fishing year uh, from no November 1st uh, each year, as it's been uh, since the inception of the FMP, uh, but shifted to January 1st, uh, so it's consistent with the calendar year. Uh, the comment period on that uh, closed on September 29th, so we are working on the final rule. Uh, under summer flounder scup and sea bass, we published a proposed rule and a notice of availability for Amendment 22 to the summer flounder scup and sea bass FMP in August. Um, this action would revise the commercial and recreational sector allocations based on the revised uh, MRIP data. Um, many, many, uh, you know, long process with the council and the commission on that. Uh, the comment period for the rule closed on September 12th, uh, and we will notify the council of our decision to approve or disapprove uh, the amendment by November 10th. Um, if we approve the amendment, uh, then we'll prepare the final rule. On September 30th, we published a temporary rule adjusting the winter to uh, quota period for SCUP. Um, so we increased the quota um, by um, 4.2 million pounds uh, and also increased the possession limit uh, consistent with um, the council's uh, framework three on that FMP. So that increases the possession limit from 12,000 pounds to 24,000 pounds uh, for the rest of the calendar year. Uh, we've had an update on Atlantic surf clam and uh, ocean cohog excessive shares amendment, but the council got a full briefing on that on Tuesday, so I won't uh, rehash that again. Um, did want to touch on research set aside programs because I know the council is uh, contemplating um, revisiting the Mid Atlantic Council's uh, RSA program from a number of years ago. It's been kind of uh, suspended. We're in the process of transferring management and implementation of all our regional RSA programs uh, from the Science Center to the regional office, uh, beginning with the current RSA grant cycle uh, that we have uh, for uh, New England Council uh, FMPs. Um, so the regional office will be assuming responsibility for uh, all grant administration, project solicitation, selection, and monitoring, uh, and I'll become the selecting official as RA, uh, shifting that responsibility from John Hare. Uh, so we'll continue to coordinate closely with the center on RSA research and other issues uh, relevant to their cooperative research programs, uh, particularly the scallop survey selections and negotiations. Uh, and the center will continue to provide critical technical, technical and scientific expertise. But as the council moves forward, uh, giving you know if it does give consideration to the the RSA program, I just want the council to keep that in mind as as we'll be heavily engaged in, in those discussions. Uh, related to that, uh, the scallop uh, research set aside notice of funding availability posted in on September 19th uh, and will remain open uh, for 60 days closing on November 18th. So this is the process by which we solicit uh, projects uh, for consideration under the scallop RSA program. Um, and given the transition in the program responsibilities I just mentioned, we're slightly behind uh, on our typical schedule for soliciting uh, proposals. 
but we intend to have the uh, awards in place on time by the start of the scallop fishing year. In early September, uh, NOAA Fisheries awarded uh, $2.3 million under the bycatch reduction engineering program to support 13 research projects, five of which uh, support projects in the greater Atlantic region. Um, there's some more details about the specific projects uh, on the agency's website. Um, let's see, you heard about the vessel speed rules, so we won't talk about that again. Um, and it was there wasn't any specific discussion, but we we are engaged, as I think many people know, um, in what we're calling phase two of the Atlantic Large Whale Take Reduction Plan process. Um, we're engaged closely with the take reduction team uh, to look at additional um, modifications that are necessary to reduce risks to North Atlantic right whales. Uh, initially, phase two was intended to focus on uh, mid Atlantic uh, lobster and uh, Jonah crab pots and traps, uh, as well as other uh, other fisheries pots, uh, pot and traps, and, and gill nets throughout the range. Um, given the status of right whales, uh, we have expanded phase two to to also take another look at um, the the northeast uh, lobster and uh, Jonah crab fishery that we already addressed. So we uh, are in a scoping period uh, on that. Uh, it closes um, the end of this week. And, uh, and then we'll be meeting with the take reduction team uh, in November um, to begin to develop or develop recommendations for us to, uh, to take to rulemaking. On September 26th, we released the final action plan to reduce Atlantic sturgeon bycatch in federal large mesh gillnet fisheries. Um, this was based on, uh, we published the draft in May uh, and uh, got comments from New England and Mid-Atlantic councils uh, and revised the action plan um, to incorporate council and public feedback. Um, we hope that the council uh, takes a look at the, the final action plan and, and that informs some actions that the council uh, should take up in 2023 um, to reduce um, bycatch of, of sturgeon in its uh, large mesh gillnet fisheries. Uh, Chris already mentioned the Omega net mesh uh, measurement gauge rule that we published uh, just as a reminder of the comment period on that rule closes on Halloween, October 31st. So we are certainly interested in your comments if you have any. With that, Mr. Chairman, I will stop and see if there are any questions. Thank you, Mike. Any questions for Mike? Everybody must be wanting to get out of here. Uh, I don't see any questions, Mike. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Northeast Fishery Science Center report. Dr. John Hare, are you on here? Or is Mike Simpson giving it? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. John Hare here. Uh, my apologies for not attending Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, I was in Maine at a, attending a public scoping. Um, session for the Atlantic large whale take reduction team process, which uh, Mike Pentney just described. Um, and I, you know, just thank Mike Simpkins for for representing the center. I'll I'll try to be quick. Um, you know, we were successful with our surveys during the summer. Uh, our, you know, leg one of the bottom trawl survey uh, was cut short because of COVID. Um, we are optimistic that we will be able to make up um, the time on leg two and leg three. Uh, the survey is occurring over the whole survey area. All the stations are planned to be sampled, um, but we are doing it in three legs rather than four. Uh, the testing for uh, for COVID is today and the, sh the sh plan is for the ship to get underway tomorrow um, as long as we don't uh, have uh, uh, individuals who are supposed to sail test positive for COVID. Um, the observer program is running. Uh, you know, much we've uh, been having our training sessions in person. Um, we have been working hard to um, catch up on the backlog in the observer data. And again, that backlog was largely sort of initiated when we had the full waiver in 2020. Um, 
we, you know, a number of our debriefers in the observer program left because there was not, you know, we didn't have the work to keep them. Um, then we started training observer again and rebuilding the debriefer group. Um, so we're back on solid footing um, and working through the data backlog. And I think you've heard about the, some of that here at your council meeting. In terms of assessment updates, um, we continue. There's five research track working groups that are, are currently meeting. Spiny dogfish, which you heard about some during this meeting. We have a black sea bass, bluefish, applying state-spaced models, and our Atlantic cod research track working group. Uh, and then the working groups for golden tilefish and yellowtail flounder have formed and are having their kickoff meetings this month. And the sea scallop research track working group will form shortly. And then the bluefish and spiny dogfish research tracks will be peer reviewed in December, uh, December 5th, um, 2022. Management tracks are fall management tracks are largely New England Council managed species, but as Mr. Hughes uh, noted, there will be a, a peer review of the monkfish north and south management, north and south stock units, um, and that is occurring, that has happened, um, and so we're working to get those assessment results to the Council. Um, in terms of just progress with the catch accounting and monitoring system, um, you, you know, the intent in the region is for both the regional office and the science center to use the same catch accounting system. And so that would mean we'd be using CAMS, catch accounting monitoring system uh, for our stock assessments and the regional office would be using that for quota monitoring. Uh, we have a peer review for that new system scheduled for January 17th to 19th. Um, it is being used in stock assessments currently for landings um, and the peer review um, will also include uh, that system for discards. Um, cooperative research, there are, I just want to you know, bring everybody's attention to uh, two cooperative research summits um, that are taking place, uh, one in Newport News on January 31st and one in Providence, Rhode Island on February 15th. And I will send uh, the information to Chris Moore to distribute. Um, these one day summits will bring together scientists, managers, fishermen, and industry representatives to, to just talk about cooperative research, um, develop new partnerships, um, and think about priorities for near term science and management challenges that can be addressed through cooperative research. The um, number of projects going on in cooperative research. I won't read through them. Uh, one of note is the, the work with the ELEX uh, fishery. Six short fin squid processing facilities have been collecting data uh, during the 2022 fishing season. Um, and we've been sort of working collaboratively uh, to explore the, you know, the oceanographic drivers behind abundance and availability. Protected species. Um, I did want to just follow up on uh, Carolyn Good's comment about the passive acoustic uh, data available in the mid-Atlantic. There are uh, passive acoustic detections of North Atlantic right whales in that sort of you know, April, May, June period. Um, all of that data is available on a website, which I will share. Um, and I'll also share the website that shows the visual data as well. Um, it's just uh, useful to understand where the data is coming from that's informing um, uh, decisions, rules and decisions that you're commenting on. Uh, offshore wind, you know, we heard is uh, taking a substantial amount of time um, at the council. It's also taking a sub substantial amount of time at the science center and the regional office. Um, we are working to finalize the federal survey mitigation strategy. Um, and we are uh, anticipating starting that mitigation program for our surveys uh, this fiscal year with new appropriations. Um, we are also um, getting close to completing a draft 
North Atlantic right whale offshore wind strategy in the coming weeks. Um, and this, uh, the intent, the goal is to protect and promote the recovery of North Atlantic right whales while responsibly developing offshore wind energy. Um, and I'll uh, make sure that the council has the, the, the draft announcement when that comes out. Um, also, just, you know, very uh, interested and committed to continuing to participate in the climate scenario planning effort and, and thank the Mid-Atlantic Council for leading that for the region. And then my last uh, uh, report item, uh, Mr. Pentany uh, talked about the RSA administrative responsibilities moving to the regional office. Um, and you know the, the science center will still stay involved uh, from a scientific perspective. Uh, research set aside as it's operated by the New England Fisheries Management Council is an important element of our regional cooperative research activities. Um, and the science center will stay fully engaged in that program going forward from a scientific perspective. So uh, Mr. Chair, that's it for my report and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, John. Any questions for John? Seeing no council questions, we'll go to the audience. Mike Wayne. Yeah, John, thanks for your report. Mike Wayne with the American Sport Fishing Association. I wanted to follow up on the right whale data. Um, is all of the tagging information for the right whales, is that housed at the Northeast Center or is it across the centers? When I talked with Lance, who conducted the model risk assessment, he said that the data they used was published right whale tagging data. So is there unpublished tagging data that you're talking about or is all that being included in the data sources? Maybe we could talk more offline if, if uh, that would be easier. Yeah, I think it'd be useful to talk offline. Uh, the two, two sort of uh, data sets which are publicly available that I discussed are one are the passive acoustic monitoring. So that's putting out a you know a buoy into the ocean or putting a, a listening device on a glider and listening for North Atlantic right whales. And then when a North Atlantic right whale is detected, that shows up in the data. And then the other are the visual uh, you know planes and ships visual sightings. Um, the tagging, the, the, the limpet tags or suction tags that are, are put on North Atlantic right whales, um, I can, we can talk about that, uh, that data set uh, offline and I can get the details before we have that conversation. Perfect, thank you. I don't see any more hands raised. Thank you, John. And with that, we'll go to the NOAA Office of General Counsel, John Almeida. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, start with the uh, summer flounder litigation brought by the state of New York. Uh, you may recall from our last meeting that New York filed a notice of appeal of the district court's decision in favor of NIMS on the summer flounder amendment 22, which was about state commercial allocations. Um, York filed its opening brief to the Second Circuit on September 13th, and NIMS will file its response brief on December 13th. So, appeal is underway. Um, the last remaining uh, case on river herring, um, this is the one brought by Natural Resources Defense Council in the District of Columbia. Um, you may recall that the court ruled in the district court ruled in NIMS's favor on most of the claims in the case, but um, wanted more information relating to two of the points in the litigation. And in June, NIMS filed a supplemental expl explanation on these two issues that the court had identified. And uh, this summer, um, the plaintiffs indicated that they would not object to NIMS um, findings in that supplemental filing. And on August 22nd, the court entered an order granting this motion for summary judgment. Um, the time for appeal has not yet expired, so we can't say that case is done, done. But at this point, there's probably no more proceedings in the district court. Turning to right whale litigation, uh, 
start with the Conservation Law Foundation Center for Biological Diversity case before Judge Boesberg, District of Columbia. Um, you may recall this summer, July 8th, the court issued a ruling granting the plaintiff's motion for summary judgment on their challenge to the 2021 Fisheries Biological Opinion and the 2021 MMPA rule. Um, at this point, uh, after ruling uh, on the legal merits of the case, the court wanted more briefing from the parties on remedy. What should it do in light of these legal so the court asked the parties to submit briefs on their positions regarding an appropriate remedy. And that briefing is ongoing right now. It'll be wrapped up in the next few weeks with plaintiff's final, they, they get a reply brief on October 21, and that will be the end of remedy briefing. The other case in DC on right whales brought by the uh, Maine Lobstermen's Association um, since our last meeting, court ruled in favor of NIMFS on its motion for summary judgment with uh, an opinion that supports a number of the analytical approaches and, and presumptions made in the biological opinion um, and affirms the validity of the models that were used uh, by the agency in developing the biological opinion. Um, on September 13th, um, the Maine Lobstermen's Association filed a notice of appeal of that decision to the D.C. Circuit. And following that notice of appeal, the state of Maine uh, and the Maine Union also filed notices of appeal. Um, don't yet have a briefing schedule from the D.C. Circuit. So we just got the fact that they are under, that the decision is under appeal. Um, the third case relating to the 2021 biological opinion was brought by the Maine Lobstering Union, District of Maine. Um, you may recall that this case um, very quickly went through the district court up to the First Circuit, and the First Circuit reversed the district court and um, this past summer in, in July. The case was remanded to the district court at the beginning of August. And since our last meeting, um, all the parties stipulated to dismissal of the case uh, on August 24, the case was dismissed by the court without a written order, just um, administratively closed. Um, now I'm going to wrap up with two cases that I've been reporting on out of uh, relating to New England Council matters. Um, the first one is the Conservation Law Foundation case on um, Framework 59, Gulf of Maine, and uh, George's Bank COD specifications. Um, this one had been pending for a while, fully briefed and just waiting for a decision from the court. And since our last meeting, the plaintiffs in the case filed a voluntary dismissal of the case. And so it was dismissed on August 23rd. That case never reached resolution uh, from with, with a judicial decision, but the, the plaintiffs agreed to just dismiss the case. Um, second New England case where there's been some development um, is for Bright Fisheries case. And this is um, uh, a case that was brought in the DC District Court. Um, and it's about uh, monitoring, the cost of monitoring. Um, district Court ruled in favor of NIMFS. Plaintiffs appealed it to the DC Circuit and on August 12th, um, a three-judge panel, DC Circuit ruled in favor of NIMFS uh, with a two-to-one two decision. So, um, you know, there's still appellate, you know, steps that could follow, but at this point, we have a decision out of the D.C. Circuit that um, affirms the district court's ruling. Um, that's all I have. If anyone has questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Any questions for John? I don't see any. Thank you for your report. Report from NOAA, Office of Law Enforcement. Caleb Gilbert. 
Welcome to Dewey Beach. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to be here. Um, nice to finally put some um, faces to some names. It's long, long overdue. And sorry I showed up so late. I would have liked to have uh, spent some time with you all last night. So uh, uh, we're playing on my part. I'll, I'll uh, try to stay for a longer period at the next meeting. But um, uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name's K Caleb Gilbert. I'm the uh, compliance liaison for the Northeast Division of the North Fisheries Office of Law Enforcement. Um, so getting into my report, NED's two priority focus areas that I mentioned at the last three uh, Mid-Atlantic meetings continue to be our priority focus areas. Uh, for the record, those are right whale related enforcement and um, increased effort to reduce the occurrence of uh, observer related incidents and help enhance observer retention. Um, in the context of those priorities, please keep in mind we continue to enforce all of the laws and regulations under our authority, such as those under the Seafood Import Monitoring Program, MSA, and other laws program and programs. Uh, we, we began work on, we don't have a uh, third quarter, I mean, uh, we don't have a written report for this meeting. We began um, compiling a fourth quarter FY22 written report to the council, but that's not yet complete. We'll have that available to the council at the December meeting. I went over some of the key metrics that came out of the third quarter written report to the council at the August meeting. Uh, since then, both OLE and our enforcement partners continued our work on our two prongs of right whale enforcement. Those are prosecution of speed rule cases and enforcement of recent Altwerp Atlantic Large Whale Take Reduction Plan phase one changes. That's both here and closed area regulations. Um, and enforcement related to our observer priority has also continued. Uh, briefly covering some of the right whale enforcement metrics um, from the fourth quarter that I have available today. Um, as of mid-September, no prosecuted 19 cases involving speed violations during the 2021-22 SMA season uh, and assessed $218,000 in penalties. Um, related to the fourth quarter take reduction plan, gear compliance, we're still tallying our metrics. While this data is preliminary and incomplete, only we only have about half of our September report data available currently. The enforcement statistics captured so far show a marked increase in both the number of patrols conducted, number of veer, uh, vessels whose gear was inspected for take reduction plan compliance, and an inc uh, increase in the compliance rate in the fourth quarter. Uh, briefly, in, in summary, our, our third quarter report, report illustrated a 73% compliance rate across 49 patrols and uh, 260 individual vessels inspected. So far for the fourth quarter, compliance rate jumps to about uh, 81%. That was across 61 patrols and 521 individual vessels inspected. While that fourth quarter uh, gear inspection rate shows that we've already doubled the number of vessels whose gear we inspected in the third quarter, please keep in mind the newly implemented gear regulation, regulations did only go into effect on May 1. Regardless, I think it's encouraging to, um, to see that uh, compliance rate increase. And we realize that this component of our current enforcement priorities are, are more New England focused, but I think it's good to point out related to our overall coastwide effort to conserve uh, right whales. Um, moving on to our work uh, we conducted in the fourth quarter related to our observer priority. Um, in addition to the activities mentioned in the third quarter written report in the August oral report, uh, we participated in an observer roundtable event in Montauk two weeks ago. If you recall from the third quarter report, we, we conducted two similar uh, roundtable events in the, in the third quarter. Uh, the, the event in Mont uh, Montauk was also uh, attended by uh, uh, New York JEA state enforcement. Um, in addition, NED, NED special agents and enforcement officers and I all followed up on numerous uh, issues identified in the monthly heads up reports that are compiled by the Center's uh, Fisheries Monitoring and Operations Division and shared with OLE. Lastly, on this topic, an uh, NED special agent participated in three center organized training events for new observer staff this summer. Um, moving on from our priorities, there are a couple more points I'd like to share with the council. First, I want to highlight a couple of impactful cases where NIMS uh, received a favorable ruling last summer. Um, on July 6, Administrative Law Judge Christine Coughlin ruled favorably for agency interests on a striped bass fishing the EEZ case that it initiated on a joint patrol with Rhode Island DEM and OLE enforcement officers. There's more information on this case available publicly on a DOG decision online. 
and I, and I already mentioned a case involving a conspiracy to smuggle prohibited catfish into the U U.S. at the August meeting. Uh, if you want to find out more information about that, a, uh, we published a NOAA Fisheries web story on, on August 29th that contains more details. Um, moving on, NED met for our annual in-service training three weeks ago. I wanted to highlight this for uh, three full days of training. OLE Director James Landon addressed NED during one of the sessions. He explained we'll continue our work on our current priorities, reemphasize that, um, and, and he emphasized our work on emerging technologies. And he even mentioned wind in the context of enforcement, first I had heard. Um, on emergency, emerging technologies first, he recognized NED has placed a lot of resources in our relatively new ROV program. I think you all have heard about from me and others in the past. On a side note, that program continued this summer, expanding the use of our OLE-owned ROV and inshore patrols. We also continued our ROV work in Lobster Management Area 3 on board a contracted platform vessel. Last of uh, three of those offshore patrols uh, concluded early this fall. Another enforcement device the director mentioned on the emerging technologies topic is the M2 mobile radar unit. That is a shore-based unit capable of monitoring speed at sea within our SMAs. This device will be deployed to help enforce speed starting in the up and coming 22-23 SMA season beginning November 1. And as you can imagine, it'll be particularly invaluable if and when we begin enforcing the updated right whale uh, speed rule. I've, sorry, I'm only bringing this up now, but I, I, I say that I've saved that point for now. Um, this radar unit will help uh, aid speed enforcement of the lower size, cla uh, size class of vessels impacted and regulated in SMAs as part of the updated sp speed rule. If most of those vessels, as we've already discussed, um, don't have the AIS requirement. And just to give you a little bit of background, um, we had three enforcement ops dedicated to speed enforcement last year. And for the up and coming SMA season, we, we plan to enhance those um, enforcement efforts, and in particular, utilizing our, our, our new, new M2 mobile radar device. And last, related to wind, the director um, made a point of mentioning, mentioning that he recognizes wind as an up-and-coming enforcement issue. Um, we don't have any plans to proactively engage in wind enforcement efforts. We don't even yet know what proactive engagement would look like related to wind. Um, we just, I just wanted to pass along to you what he explained to us, that we recognize the magnitude of the government's goals for wind expansion in the EZ in the coming decade. And that's, that's all I have for uh, today's report, Mr. Chairman. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Caleb. Any questions? Comments? Pat Lennox. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the report. Uh, just a quick question. The M2, if, if that is deployed uh, and the, you start to um, enforce the 10 mile an hour or 10 knot speed zone. How will that work? You say it's a land based system. Um, how, how will that work just briefly? I'll be able to um, comment better. I think at the December meeting, ask, ask me that question again. We have uh, got our first training scheduled for the end of the month. Um, I believe in Falmouth or I think we're actually planning on testing it at the mouth of the, the Cape Cod Canal. I don't know if that opened my, my lips too, too wide there. But um, we're, we're going to, it's just for testing procedures. So we'll, we're, we're, I'll be involved and, and, and others will get up to speed on training. So I'll, I'll, have, I'll have more in December. Thank you very much for your report. U.S. Coast Guard, Lieutenant Commander Matt Haley. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, from the Coast Guard um, over the past two months, we've conducted a little less than 160 boardings um, offshore. Um, of that, about 60% of them were on the rec uh, community, uh, which is what we historically see during the summer months, um, with the rec community being a, a larger presence out there. Um, of the boardings that we did conduct, uh, did a lot of focus on uh, HMS while they were still running in uh, Virginia and, uh, and up into New Jersey. Um, from the boardings that we did, we, uh, we found uh, two uh, violations that we issued enforcement action reports for. Uh, one was for a uh, rec boat that was engaged in fishing without a permit. And then another one, um, one of our cutters conducted a boarding about 50 miles offshore um, off of Virginia. And uh, the boarding team found uh, two undersized tuna, three uh, that were unidentifiable fish because they had the heads and tails cut off. And um, they were also in possession of uh, 
uh, a little over 20 uh, yellowfin tuna without a federal permit uh, on board. Um, so moving on to the ops, uh, we, we didn't have any scheduled uh, planned ops during the last two months. Uh, moving forward, though, um, as we get into the right whale uh, season with the, the zones that uh, come into play in November, uh, we'll, we'll likely be doing some joint ops with NOAA, um, as Caleb said, and we're also uh, looking at doing a uh, targeted op around striped bass uh, in the EEZ as they come down in New Jersey uh, toward the end of November. Uh, for mission, uh, commercial fishing vessel uh, safety efforts on the metrics there, we've uh, conducted 43 uh, dock side exams, issued 32 uh, decals, and uh, we, we don't have any uh, commercial fishing vessel terminations out of the past two months, which is obviously a good thing. And um, we also, we didn't have any search and rescue cases related to uh, uh, commercial fishing vessels, um, marine casualties, anything like that. So. Uh, um, with that, uh, that concludes my report. Uh, subject to any questions. Thank you, Matt. Any questions? Seeing none, we'll go on to liaison reports. Peter Hughes, New England Council report. Do I have a question? Oh, okay. Go ahead, Peter. Um, so this is the liaison report from the New England Council meeting last week. First order of business was Regional Minister, Minister Penny swore in two new council members. They are Peter Whalen from New Hampshire and Eric Hansen from Massachusetts. Mr. Penny also swore in returning member Rick Bellavance from Rhode Island. Uh, the council then moved on to their elections of officers. Eric Reed and Vice Chair Bellavance were both successful in their campaigns and thus re-elected to their positions. Uh, the Monkfish Committee report I'd already given. Uh, I will note that I did receive a message that we are still um, crossing our fingers that we are going to take final action in December after a committee meeting between now and then. Let's see. Um, Scallop Committee report. Uh, the council received an update on framework 36, including a presentation on surveys and projections and management measures that will be finalized at the December council meeting. So we didn't get into the, the, the meat and bones of what those measures are going to be just yet because they are currently out with the PDT for analysis. Um, and we will be prior to the December meeting to um, finalize that and recommend preferred alternatives. Um, in regards to leasing, after three failed motions, NEFM, the New England Management Council, decided not to develop an amendment in regards to the voluntary leasing of days at sea and access area trips to limited access scallop fishery. Moving on to the Transboundary Management Guidance Committee report. Um, we uh, split um, management of stocks that we share with Canada um, particular tube stocks are very important to us. That's the um, Eastern Georgia's Banks cod and the yellowtail flounder. And the council approved uh, the TEC's recommendations of Eastern Georgia's Bank cod, 520 metric tons, and Georgia's Bank summer Georgia's Bank yellowtail flounder of 200 metric tons. Um, fisheries that take place out on Georgia's um, species so there's there's sub ACLs that are set for these for the different species. Groundfish committee report the council took up three motions in regards to framework 65 which is specifications and management council removed the council removed revised rebuilding strategy for Southern New England, Mid-Atlantic, Atlantic winter flounder from consideration, framework adjustment 65. Council removed additional measures to promote stock rebuilding of Southern New England, Mid-Atlantic winter flounder from consideration in framework 65. Um, I don't have the rationale associated with the, those two motions um, as they were not provided in the uh, just the motions that I received after the council meeting. So it's, it's kind of hard for me to go into those two motions that were made and how they would, um, how they would affect this, this council. But they've removed one and they've removed the additional measures. Third motion that the 
uh, was made was that the council send a letter to mid Atlantic states. Communicating concern with recent levels of recreational catch of Georgia's bank cod. The request consideration of complementary rulemaking regarding slot limit possession limit season restrictions. So, I think all the states sitting around this table can anticipate a letter. From the council, I don't know that I don't know that this council will receive a letter. I think this that motion is going to the states. Um, just a little update on that. Uh, Habitat committee. Council took up four motions during the Habitat committee report. Just going to read these. Um, they're important and give us some indication of what's happening. That the council initiate an Atlantic salmon aquaculture framework. Focused on possession of farmed salmon raised according to NASCO standards. Other issues to explore include enforcement and reporting. Council would continue to consult and coordinate on individual aquaculture projects in addition to developing this framework. Uh, in regards to dedicated habitat research areas, uh, the council recommends that the regional administrator. Retain cell wagon dedicated habitat research area designation for another three years with the review process using the authority granted by the council in omnibus essential fish habitat amendment two. Second motion that the council remand back to the habitat committee for further review whether to remove the Georgia's bank uh, dedicated habitat research area. In regards to the Great South Channel, the council voted to forward. Habitat committee's recommendation PDT analysis regarding exempted fishing permit based projects that might be considered within the Great South Channel Habitat Management Area to the regional administrator. Specifically, that such projects should be thoughtfully designed. Station fishing should be strategically. In regards to herring, and this is my last update, uh, the council received and finalized the 2023 25. Specification package and voted to submit it to NIPS. And in regards to framework seven, which is kind of a trailing action in there, um, framework seven is the COD, cod spawning protection measures. Uh, a motion was put forth to discontinue work on, on that framework. That motion failed, so that issue will be heard back to for additional work. Thank you, Peter. Any questions for Peter? Seeing none, let's go to the South Atlantic Council liaison report. And Dewey's got a plane to catch to go duck hunting. So this is going to be short, I bet. Given a beautiful day outside, yeah. and this material is in the briefing book, and I'm sure everybody's already read it. And so uh, with that, I conclude my report. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Probably won't have a whole lot of questions in to ask you. That, that is under tab uh, 15 B and all uh, below that. Thank you, Shelly, for putting it in there. <laughs> Thank you, Dewey. Uh, with that, we're going to go to other business and general public comment. And I know Bonnie Brady has a question. So, Bonnie, if you're ready, go ahead. Can you hear me? Partly. Can you guys hear me? Yes, now. Uh, uh, now better? Okay. Um, if I, sorry, I just heard it and I wasn't able to figure out how, how to raise my hand. And, and, um, but Caleb, I was wondering. Hang on, Bronnie, break it up. But I think that's I want to keep from his hunting. Yeah, hang, hang on a second, Bonnie. I see your question in the chat. I think you want to ask Caleb. Yes, exactly. By wind is an enforcement issue. I, that's correct, but I'd like it to be done quickly so Dewey doesn't miss his duck hunting opportunity. Sorry. It, it, it won't take long because I have nothing more to add on that comment. I, I apologize, Bonnie. Yeah, that that that's really all I have. I I, I wish I could provide more, but. I, I, I wanted to mention when will go ahead. What obviously this is some new directive. What exactly 
does this mean? Are you going to be enforcing when survey boats are out or when guys go through gear, or is it just that you're going to come up with some sort of focus in the near future? And if so, are you going to include industry in those conversations? Uh, n none of the above, Bonnie. We, we don't have any proactive plans in place, but if and when we do, I, I would like to think that we incorporate all interested parties in, in whatever our um, plans might be at that point. But right now, it is we, we do not have proactive plans. We're just simply recognizing it as a potential enforcement issue for the future. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is there any other business? Yes, we have another question. Or comment, Greg D. Domenico. Thank you, Chair. I'll be as brief as possible on what I think is an important topic. Um, and perhaps someone, uh, uh, the regional administrator, is still on the phone, or perhaps Eric Reed or uh, Peter, or even the executive director can consider my question. Uh, last week during the New England Council meeting, there was a lengthy discussion about uh, adjustments to the FMPs to. Um, I guess, address the secretarial action on the monuments. Um, industry is a little confused as to if the secretarial, if under a secretarial um, action, a complete prohibition to fishing uh, is enacted and implemented, then what is the need for an FMP review or FMP re changes to reflect that closure? Mike Patton, I'm going to put the ball in your court. Um, yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. So, yeah, we had a discussion last week, um, and we provided the New England Council a brief update on um, our our intended process moving forward for uh, implementing regulations consistent with the president's proclamation on the. Uh, canyons and seamounts monument. Uh, we provided also a brief uh, uh, overview of the expected timeline for um, the Fish and Wildlife Service working with us on the monument management plan. And what I described to the council was the process we intended to use to uh, incorporate the fishing restrictions into uh, our fishing regs. And we intend to use uh, the process um, contemplated through the Magnuson Stevens Act, where we would um, consult with both of our councils uh, on that process as we develop um, the action, um, provide an opportunity for the councils to review uh, the rule and the draft amendment, um, and then publish an, a proposed rule and final rule as we normally do. Uh, that's the, pro the process we intend to follow. Um, the only real alternative to that process uh, would be uh, to just uh, implement um, the regulations through the Administrative Procedure Act uh, without consulting with the two councils. Um, we would still do a proposed rule and a final rule, um, but we felt, uh, given the interest of the councils uh, on this, that we would uh, it would be preferable for us to work through and, and consult with the councils on that process. Uh, Mr. Pentany, can you hear me? It's Greg DiDomenico. Yep, loud and clear. Um, does that change things in the future for uh, if we were fortunate enough to get a secretarial action to uh, revoke those prohibitions? How would the agency handle that at that particular time? Would they have to open up the books again on the FMPs to uh, allow fishing? So I think we got a similar question last week at New England Council. Um, I said it was pretty speculative uh, in the sense that uh, we don't know what any future proclamation might look like. Uh, it wouldn't be a secretarial action. It would be a presidential action, I believe, would, is what would be required to change those parameters. Um, if there was a future proclamation to change those, those parameters and those restrictions, um, then we would certainly work through the appropriate process um, to make the regulations consistent with whatever future proclamation we may get. 
Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm sure the industry will follow up with you. We're still a little confused why uh, we need you need to take these actions, but also would would um, you know, um, like you said, if a presidential action took place to reverse those, it would be helpful to have it uh, done quickly. And and in the case that the FMP had to be changed, then we'd probably lose some time on getting that accomplished. But um, like I said, appreciate your back back and forth, and I'm sure we'll have other additional questions for you. Thank you. Greg, do we have any other new business to bring to the council? Mike Penny, you have a response. Well, yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just to follow up, and because I think the fundamental question that Greg Domenico asking is, is why are we preparing? <clears throat> why are we preparing regulations? I think this was the intent, Craig. Why are we preparing regulations if fishing is is already prohibited? I mean, and and we've said this that you know by virtue of the proclamation itself, um, fishing activities are prohibited in the area. Um, and so maybe there, it, it may be that there's a perception that um, us, uh, the agency implementing regulations is uh, superfluous because fishing is already prohibited. Um, I would just point to the uh, proclamation itself, which, uh, you know, so this is the president directs the Secretary of Commerce uh, and the Secretary of Interior to, to prepare a joint management plan, uh, which we're working on. Um, but it also directs the Secretary of Commerce to promulgate implementing regulations. And so that's the piece where um, we as, you know, agents of the Secretary of Commerce are required to promulgate regulations to implement um, the restrictions and the, and, and the measures in the proclamation. Um, so the, the issue, uh, what's at issue is the process that we utilize to implement those regulations. Um, whether we go straight to a uh, rulemaking through the uh, under the APA or whether we um, engage with the councils, consult with the councils as contemplated by the Magnuson Stevens Act. I hope that clarifies things for you. He's nodding his head. Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Just to be clear, commercial fishing is prohibited. Recreational fishing is allowed. Any more business? I don't see any more hands with that. I want to call the end of this meeting. Thank you, everyone. Hope you enjoyed Dewey Beach a lot better today than two or three days ago. Uh, with that, I'll see everybody in Annapolis.